talk today is going to be about um, uh, writing RFPs, particularly writing RFPs with the, with the objective of, of, of uh, finding a partner that, uh, in Stan's view, gets your goals um, and um, you know, finding, finding the right vendor for, for, your, for your project. So um, we'll introduce ourselves and then we'll get into, into the agenda. So my name is Bjorn Thompson. Uh, I'm a Digital Experience Solutions Director at Inject. Uh, I've been in the world of Drupal. Hi. Oh, sure. How about this? I actually have yeah. this amazing technology here. <laughs> A master of technology. Oh my gosh. There we are. The recording officially starts now. So, and how are y'all doing? So my name is uh, Bjorn Thompson. I'm, di I'm a digital experience solutions director at ImageX. Um, and I've, I've been working in Drupal for about 15 years as a developer, as a UX designer, uh, and more recently uh, I've been with the kind of business development group at, at ImageX. Uh, we respond to a variety of uh, business, op business opportunities, and we probably respond to about um, 50 or 60 RFPs per year, which is quite a bit. So in that experience over the past five years, um, we've developed um, some kind of best practices and some, some ideas on how you, can, uh, how you can prepare for an RFP, how you can write an effective RFP that's gonna find you the right vendor for your project, and some of the things that you can do afterwards to ensure that you um, go through what can sometimes be a painful or challenging process and maybe make it less painful uh, and make it more uh, efficient and simpler. So that's me, and I'll turn things over to Ashley. We'll do that one. There we go. It's not that way, I don't have to hold it. Um, yeah, my name is Ashley Stegg. I've been a sales director here at ImageX for about a year, um, but I've been working in technology for about 15, and part of my job is helping businesses solve solutions, uh, sorry, come up with solutions and solve problems with technology. So your budget is $101,000. You've triggered an RFP process. Uh, the bane of many of our existences, uh, be it on the vendor or the client side. So let's talk through some of the challenges inherent in the process. So RFPs, they can feel a lot like a blind date. <laughs> you can accidentally rule out the ideal partner. Um, it's really hard to know exactly what to ask for and the right words to use sometimes. Um, they can encourage an adversarial relationship from the hop, and also they're very prone to misunderstanding, especially when there's no opportunity for clarification. So this can have a lot of different impacts on your business. So a poorly thought out RFP uh, can lead to starting a project off on the wrong foot, uh, long delays within your process, confusion about the, the who, what, where, when, why, and also getting caught up in legal, legalese, rather, and losing sight of your goals. So it could end up becoming more of a competition to see who can fill out the, the right number of forms and specifics over who can actually solution the best, um, but provide, rather, the best solution for your project. So we propose that there is um, a better way. So if you're still required to, formal, uh, to follow a very formal RFP, RFP process or a formal process to procure a vendor, there are a few things that you can do to tweak the process that will help, um, help you and help vendors as well. So creating a great partner-driven RFP is very important. Um, you wanna do your homework. You wanna know, generally speaking, what is out there in the marketplace. And you want to structure the RFP to attract a partner. So this is not an, uh, a one and done kind of relationship. You want somebody to be invested in your business along with you and actually want to see the solution be implemented and really care. So another important piece is to avoid typical RFP traps. Um, we'll get into what those specifics are a little bit later on. And it's important to have a well-defined selection process, again, for efficiency. So can we tweak the RFP process beyond some of these, these different points I've, I've mentioned previously. So, I mean, if you can avoid the RFP process, we strongly encourage doing that, just because it, and again, it will it'll create more of a collaborative kind of experience, and um, it will ideally help you choose the best vendor. So, a couple of alternatives. Um, you can have a closed or semi-closed RFP process. So, essentially, you're tapping certain bidders and asking for their proposals. Um, you can also offer individual calls if possible. So this is great for building rapport and also um, really clarifying any of those, those kind of misconceptions that could eke out in the process. And it's also important to carefully structure your pre-bid conference calls. So make that a more collaborative Q&A type environment rather than just reading through the rope proposal. 
So in preparation for the RFP, this, this quote, it <laughs> defines things pretty well, I'd say. Um, in a consensus-based organization, 17 against one is considered a tie. Um, I think of it like a jury trial, basically very similar. <laughs> so you wanna set yourself up for success. And you can do this internally by assigning a really strong project lead, getting alignment from all of the different stakeholders, and setting clear expectations as to what the outcomes reasonably will be. And then on top of all this, make sure that you assign a good business writer to oversee the RFP process. Basically what they can do is they can grab all of these different requirements from different stakeholders, digest it, and then spit something out that is really great for um, partners to understand, as well as really clearly articulates what it is that you're looking for. So when it comes to getting alignment, there's gonna be wishes and <laughs> priorities, there always are. Um, but we recommend taking a list of say, however many are up here, and distilling it down to say five or six. Have really those North, North Star kind of pieces that you can get all of your different stakeholders behind. Sure, it might not be everybody's top choice, but say everybody will at least have some of their top fives included in this list. Same thing with priorities. There's more priority priorities than, than other ones. And Again, it, it comes down to distilling exactly what it is you, you truly need for a successful project and a successful solution. And again, if you can get alignment from your stakeholders around a more, um, more kind of tr truncated list, it's just going to, to mean that um, the project will be more successful and also get more buy-in internally. So the last point here on setting expectations. Um, so again, it's, it's really important to help let stakeholders see the vision. Um, so you wanna help them understand the big picture. Why are you implementing um, this particular solution? What, what are the outcomes? Um, and then it's also important to socialize the fact that not everybody is gonna get every single thing that they're looking for, but it will be a vast improvement over the current state. And then the, the last piece is there may be more than one way to get there. So effectively you are bringing in an expert. That's why you're going through this whole process. So it's important to consider that maybe your vendor could bring a different kind of approach to things that maybe you hadn't thought of. So on that note, I'll, I'll throw it over to Bjorn to talk about the actual structuring of the RFP document. Great. Yeah, thanks Ashley. So um, we talked a bit about the homework you can do to prepare for an effective RFP. Now we're actually gonna talk about what we found to be effective uh, ways to uh, communicate to your vendor what you're trying to achieve um, and find the right partner through the, through the actual authoring of the RFP itself. So um, because I've probably personally looked at maybe, maybe I'm exaggerating a little bit, maybe 500 to 600 RFPs and had responded to hundreds of them, um, I've learned through sometimes painful experience what some of the things are that really um, you know, help us craft a solution. So some of the key kind of things to do when you're writing an RFP is, is just setting high level, high level goals. It may sound like the simplest thing in the world. I mean, isn't an RFP a technical document? Of course you'd set, set high level goals, but you'd be surprised or maybe you wouldn't be surprised how often you get to page 41 or page 82 or 103 and you're still not sure what the project is even about or what the um, kind of rationale for the project is. So making sure that you've uh, articulated to the vendor, this is what we're trying to achieve and here's how, uh, here's how we're hoping to get there. Distinguishing, distinguishing between uh, nice to haves uh, and must haves. And actually kind of talked about that and I'll talk about it a little bit more. Um, being clear and realistic about time and budget. Um, sometimes the conversation particularly about budget is a kind of standoff, um, you know, where the vendor says, you know, what's your budget? And um, the proponent says, well, what do you think our budget, sh budget should be? Giving people a little bit of guidance about how much money you're prepared to spend can, can not only lead to much more qualified bids, uh, but often much stronger and better solutions. And I'll, I'll talk about that. And then the fourth one is avoiding dictating solutions. It's a little bit kind of like what, what Ashley said. The more you tell the vendor how to do the work, um, the less likely you are to find the really kind of uh, sophisticated, qualified vendors that you're looking for. And then finally, being specific about integrations. And not just integrations, any complex elements of the, of the project, um, trying to be as clear and as, um, as detailed as you can about those elements so they can respond effectively and give you a budget that is uh, you know, realistic and uh, that you, uh, is based on solid evidence. So 
writing a business case, when Ashley talked earlier about assigning a lead to write the RFP, that's actually really important advice because um, an RFP is actually, to a certain extent, a persuasive document. You're trying to, trying to find the right vendor in the same way that you're trying to find the right candidate in a job interview. You're trying to find someone who's gonna be a fit for you. And in order to do that, you need to persuasively and concisely explain what you're trying to achieve. So for example, if you're a higher education institution, you might, um, you might have the goal of attracting more prospective students. So right up front in the RFP, it would be very much to your benefit to explain, this is what we're trying to achieve. Um, here's the high level goal, help us understand how we can get there. Some of the must haves within that might be um, just having a better visual design or UX ex experience, uh, easier to use navigation and, and good program pages, all correlated with better engagement for prospective students. Some of the nice to haves might be interactive campus map, you know, in-depth in event integrations, all, all the things that might be tactical decisions you make along the way, uh, but aren't necessarily core to the solution. And there might even be other ways to get there uh, and you're leaving that open to the vendor. The second one is, and again, um, if you work in the field of technology and you're on the other side of the vendor um, proponent table, this might seem like common sense, but uh, it's very, very uh, unfortunately common <laughs> for people to not do this. So what really helps uh, vendors be successful in their responses is presenting problems, um, not, not solutions. So for example, um, articulating the goal. Um, the content needs to be more focused on users. Uh, the navigation needs to be clear. Um, maybe help us uh, understand your process, walk us through your design discovery process. Instead of, and this is kind of the, the doofus um, approach to, the, uh, as opposed to the Gallon approach, if that, I'm not dating myself with that reference a little, um, is uh, you know, key pages need a flexible slider. Why? Is there some reason why it has to be that way? We need a mega menu uh, with no sort of uh, explanation of why it needs to be that way. And in the, you, know, you can tell when you read those that maybe that group has, has looked at five sites in their sector and they've kind of cherry picked the things that they like um, when it's a, a lot more beneficial to step back and give the vendor the space and the scope to define the, um, the solution itself. And a big thing that we see a lot um, is people saying, this project will take six months. In the first three weeks, you are going to do five workshops. This is what those workshops will include. When you do things like that, um, you're actually going to opt, um, you're, you're opting out some of the best vendors who have, you know, often a very strong, sophisticated approach they've built up over the over years. Um, and allowing them to explain the process rather than forcing, forcing a process onto them is absolutely going to result in better uh, matches between you and the vendor. So the other one I mentioned is, um, is being specific about requirements. And that could be integrations, that could be complex um, systems requirements, UX requirements, a variety of things. Um, there we go. Got a little trigger happy with my, with my uh, clicky finger. So it's extremely common. I'd say more than half of the RFPs that we see uh, have a list somewhere in them, uh, a heading like systems or integrations. And it'll literally say something like Salesforce, ERP, CR. Uh, and because of the lack of information in those sections, it's extremely difficult. First, it's difficult to estimate because uh, we don't really know what we're estimating. Um, so what that means as a consequence for the proponent is they might get estimates ranging from um, you know, 50 hours to 500 hours, uh, which makes it very, very difficult for them to evaluate the solutions. That's the problem number, number one. And the second one is the more information you give to the, to the vendor, the more likely they're gonna be able to impress you with their understanding of your problem and their, and their solutions. So of course, when you're writing an RP, you're writing it because you don't know everything yet. You don't have a solution yet. So you might not be able to articulate every part of what you need, but just being a little more detailed, kind of writing out user stories for, for the vendor. For example, our Salesforce system will pull three required fields for display and the program. Or the list must update hourly um, so that uh, you know, it's accurate and up to date. You don't have to give a lot. Vendors are very used to working with a small amount of <laughs> information, uh, but the more detail you can give, the more likely you're gonna get strong responses. So those are some of the tips around writing an RFP um, that's going to attract good vendors. So if you're successful, you're probably going to get a fair number of responses, which is a challenge in itself, is how do you go about scoring that in a way that's fair, in a way that helps you, in a way that identifies the best vendors, it gives, gives um, them a chance to um, kind of shine in the process. So I'll talk about that. 
So the key, the key is making sure <laughs> you're scoring things that matter. That joke won't mean anything to people listening on YouTube later. Um, so some of the some of the advice that you would hear if you talk to a procurement office, and certainly from our experience, is these are the typical indicators of a strong proposal. This is when you know someone has thought about your problem in a maybe a deeper way, uh, and, the, and the solution that, that they're proposing is, is based on understanding you. And the first one, and by far the most important, is a customized response. Everyone who has received RFPs has had the experience of reading a document that you know was put together from you know, paste, pasting in previous responses to other proposals. It, it leaves a bad impression, um, and it certainly, uh, you know, the ability to think in a deeper way about the nature of the problem that the, that, that proponent is, is experiencing and provide a highly customized response. That is an absolute indicator of a great partner who's, who's going to be doing that with you over the, over the years you'd be working with them. It's, it's kind of like the first step in a, in a really good relationship. A clear understanding of the problem. It's often really useful in an RFP if you can say, tell us what you think the problem is. Uh, could you kind of summarize the problem back to us and then what do you think your solution would be? This gives the vendor a chance to kind of shine and, and to um, kind of walk you through uh, you know, how they would approach the, your problem. And if, if you've articulated your problem concisely and well, uh, it just means that you're gonna have an even better response. A willingness to challenge assumptions. I think all of us want a vendor who isn't just gonna nod along and say, uh-huh, uh-huh, yeah, that, that design, that's the right one, uh, because the boss thinks so. Um, we want them to be able to say, well, actually, you know, we think you need more user testing, or we think that maybe you could take, you could benefit from a phased approach. So their ability to push back gently and give you different ideas and different ways of approaching the problem. In a kind of related way, presenting alternate approaches. Maybe because for most people writing an RFP, they don't do it every day. They don't do it every year. Um, they're not experts in that process. But the vendor is often an expert in uh, shaping a project. So they might be able to, to present to you ideas that you haven't even thought of about how you could get to your goal. So these kind of, these things all work in harmony. You leave the solution open, you let the vendor tell you how they can get there. And then finally, concier, concier? that's a new word that now exists, um, conci concise and clear themes. And this is, this is a symbiotic thing. The more you've articulated those concise and clear themes, uh, our themes are, you know, better usability, better performance, uh, you, we want a long-term partnership. The more you tell the vendor what's important to you, the better they'll be able to let you know how they can get there. Um, so the key with, I think, any persuasive document is, do you remember what was proposed three days later or three weeks later? Um, the goal of a strong proposal, and you know a proposal is strong, when it makes an impression, when you remember it later, and when you talk about it in your committee, you remember that one and what they said. Now, after you've gone through that process of um, you know, procuring the, the, um, the proposals, at some point you need to winnow them down into a manageable number that you can work with. Um, so this is our experience on what, what some effective kind of tips and tricks for, for selecting vendors. Of course, here we are a vendor on stage at a conference telling you how to select vendors. Uh, so maybe a slight conflict, conflict of interest, but I think this comes from our true experience. Um, it is very helpful to have a scoring model. Scoring models help um, reduce uh, subjectivity. Um, they provide a guidance and a framework for your team. But also, if you strictly stick to the scoring and, um, you, for example, you got in a situation where you, the vendor you want is like third place, that, didn't, that wasn't a very good scoring <laughs> system. So you have to also think about your, your gut and your common sense and talking together about what do you really think, um, you know, the best vendors we're hearing from. What are, what would work best for us? Leaving aside just the score, if you can. Um, sorting it into three piles, it's very difficult to evaluate proposals, often because you get a wide range of solutions, a wide range of budgets. So trying to sort them out as soon as you can into like the no's, those will usually stand out. It's just kind of generic or not very accurate. And then the maybes. The maybes matter because the problem with the RFP process, or a challenge with the RFP process, I should say, is you know, sometimes a great vendor doesn't have the time um, to respond to you in a way that is, is deep and thoughtful. Um, you know, they might have three proposals they're responding to that week. Maybe I'm speaking from slight experience here. And, you know, they're trying to get the last one in and at the end of the week, and maybe they don't give you the depth of the response that you, that you were hoping for. 
if you give them a second crack and ask them follow-up questions, if you see something in the proposal but it's not quite there yet, um, allow them the chance to address those deficiencies. That can often be very revealing. And now if they have the time and the opportunity to kind of let you know um, the, the depth they're capable of, that can often kind of help you clarify what the right, the right um, candidates are. When we get down to a manageable number, absolutely, trying to get maybe down to three to five, as human beings, I think we're all familiar with the research on how many things we can hold in our brains at any given time. Um, the fewer vendors you have to choose from, the easier it's gonna be to make a decision. And that's good for you because then your project will um, move forward in a more expeditious way. And then setting up a clear work back schedule. Every element of this from the planning to the writing um, to the after time, it's all a project, right, in itself. Um, and you need to manage it. Uh, you need to set a clear work back for a when you're gonna arrange the interviews, when you're going to um, meet as a committee, and usually the first meeting, you don't make a decision 100%. So maybe scheduling a few meetings so you can walk through the complexities of what, you're, what you need to talk through. Um, and then understanding like an actual schedule that fits with, the, with your team's vacation time, with their workload, that's going to uh, not result in delays. Because we get a lot of situations where people get so overwhelmed with this decision process that they end up um, spending three months or even longer um, kind of just sort of lost in that state. And then the longer that goes on, the harder it is to remember the solutions that you proposed for in the first place and it becomes a vicious cycle. So leaving yourself enough time to get this done. Evaluating a finalist presentation. Um, so I think we all know from our own experience that not every brilliant developer and creative designer is a natural presenter. Um, you know, it's just that people who pitch well don't always deliver well and vice versa. So how do we find a partner within a, what's kind of an artificial format? It's a bit like a job interview. When you're interviewing someone for a job, are you interviewing them on how good they are at a job interview or at the job itself? So we want to give them, give those people a chance to shine in a way that mirrors how you're going to actually be working with them. So make it more of a working session. Uh, make it a conversation. Um, one of the indicators of a challenging uh, finalist presentation is, you know, you've got half an hour to answer 13 questions. So it just becomes this kind of like speed round where you're just, where you're just walking through, um, you know, these really fast responses under extreme time pressure. Is that really telling you what it's like to work with that person? Probably not. <laughs> Keeping the agenda flexible enough so the vendor can bring their own thoughts. So maybe asking them, how would you solve this design problem? Or can you walk us through a case study um, of how you solved a similar problem? Focusing on the Q&A, it's very common um, that as you talk to three or five vendors, the parameters of their processes often could be quite similar. They have a, you know, you've chosen good vendors, they often have very sophisticated processes, and it's difficult sometimes to tell uh, which one is going to be good uh, because they all have like mature processes. So when it, but when it can actually be revealing is in the, in the, the question and answer period, when you have a chance to drill in and talk to them and, and try to understand um, you know, how they think, uh, how they would solve a problem, maybe presenting them with a novel s situation and getting them to respond to it. The Q&A is often the most valuable part of this entire process. And then the last thing is, I mean, the point of any presentation is not to make the presenter feel nervous. The more nervous they feel, the less likely they're going to be uh, thinking on their feet and nimble and responsive. So trying to establish rapport and make a little small talk. It's common because RFPs are intended to be objective, um, you know, a format, is that people will kind of sit back and say like, okay, you tell us our, your presentation now. That often is actually a bit of a mistake. It's very beneficial and good for you to try to establish a little bit of rapport. That also helps you understand what it's like to work with this person. You're not, you're not evaluating, um, you know, helicopter parts. You're evaluating what a, a relationship that you're gonna have for a long time. Hopefully a long time. And then finally, the last point I just wanted to mention here is about negotiating with vendors. Um, and that can be a very um, productive process that actually helps you understand uh, that team better. Or it can get tied up in months. Even we've had multiple experiences where it's taken a year or longer in this process. And that's not what you want. Again, it's frustrating, it's demotivating when you get stuck in that, that situation. So you can shorten that often dramatically with a few uh, guidelines. The first one is taking a collaborative approach. Um, 
you know, there's naturally going to be documents. Probably they're going to be reviewed by various teams, legal. Um, so the more that you can make that process kind of a conversation and a collaboration, the better. So instead of like sending a document version, you know, 0 0.0001 and sending back 0 0.002 with a whole bunch of red lines, maybe get together and talk. Um, you know, sit together with the document, walk through it together, point out your concerns, point out where you, th where you think um, legal might have a challenge so that you've helped the vendor to create a good first draft uh, and they're not kind of struggling to try, try to guess what, what, you, uh, what you need and, and what um, sort of the parameters that you need to work within are. Finding out about the internal process ahead of time is also really helpful. So as the more you know about um, all the different parties from your side that need to be involved and what that actual process looks like, the better that is for them. Then they can figure out um, you know, who they need to include on their side. Maybe they need to then include um, some folks on their team with expertise in those areas. Um, it just helps them succeed and helps them move along more quickly. The third one is trusting that the partner is acting in good faith. I mean, that kind of sounds like common sense, um, but you know, the more we can make this um, you know, non-adversarial and uh, a kind of a dialogue, the better. So a lot of times a partner will have really, really good ideas about how to, uh, how to approach um, maybe a sticking point where you're, where you're not sure to how to move forward. That vendor has probably honestly written um, you know, hundreds of proposals, responded to uh, many, many, many uh, technical documents like SOWs and MSAs. They can actually help guide you um, and help you sometimes find the solutions that um, from your, typically most people don't have a huge amount of experience with this, so they can help guide you through that, that process. Don't be afraid to ask. So in summary, when you're preparing for an RFP, it can be a kind of a nervous feeling. <laughs> you know, it's usually not associated with a tremendous amount of fun or delight or excitement. Um, and I'm not gonna come up, sit here and pretend that, that, that uh, this process makes it more delightful. But there are ways to make this process more efficient. And there are also ways to communicate um, to the vendor that, that you want. Um, you know, you can, you can structure the RFP so that the vendor will succeed. Writing it in a way, preparing it in a way so that you're helping them shine and you're helping see the best parts of what they have to offer. And the more open you leave it, the less restrictive you make it, the more likely you are to find that long-term partner over time. So with that, we'll turn things over to questions. Yeah, that's a good question. I don't know, have you ever encountered RFP from an internal I, I have audience? Been, yeah, in full disclosure, I haven't, but I would, I would guess. I think there'd be a lot of similarities. Yeah, a yeah. lot of similarities, but maybe the adversarial piece ideally wouldn't be existing. Hopefully, internal, it could be. It could be against it, more in partner, for example. Um, yeah. yeah but I'm not sure, I trust. I think even in an internal situation, you're trying to sell to people most of the time. Um, and clarity about the business case um, and the ability to um, articulate what you want clearly is very, very important. You might have to no, not necessarily have to go through some of those same hurdles for procurement, uh, but explaining, persuading, communicating, I think it's still gonna be, th that, that part's gonna be very, very important. Yeah, and certainly understanding like the process ahead of time helps speed things up quite a bit. Did we answer your question? Such a great question. That's an excellent question. Yeah, I do have thoughts on that personally. And they're, they're my opinion, but I'll just say what I think. And yeah. maybe I'm just kind of ta I'm talking a lot. I'll let Ashley talk. <laughs> no, it's fine. Yeah. Okay. You, I'll, I'll say it quickly. Yeah. I think um, it's very common for scoring to weigh heavily in the area of um, like previous experience. Um, so it's very, it, you know, it's, it's natural because the RFP process is very risk averse by nature. And most of the organizations who use RFPs are very risk averse by nature, higher education, non-profit, uh, not, maybe not profit, but, um, you know, public institutions. 
So you want to bet on a sure thing. Um, you know, nobody goes broke uh, choosing IBM, right? Maybe they did, I don't know. Um, I don't know if that's an expression, it's any truth to it at all. Uh, so, you know, you often see like scoring where it's like 50% on, um, you know, the background of the vendor. I feel like that might be a little bit too much weighting on that section. What would be potentially more useful is, is to have more weighting on the solution itself and like what they're actually proposing, what's novel about, uh, about what they have to offer. Um, there are many, many vendors uh, who will probably have the sector experience you're looking for, um, but you know, finding somebody who understands you, who gets you, I think that's the more important thing. Just personal, that's my personal feeling. Um, yeah, I'll stop there. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, it kind of mirrors like how like if you talk to a business um, writing expert, they'll typically tell you start with solution rather than your background or your your, your case study, and I think that that's kind of um, there's there's logic in that approach for sure. Yeah. Hi. It's a really good question. Sure. Yeah. 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 Exactly. So, well, we had some interesting ones. Yeah. That yeah. I'm, I'm thinking about a recent one. Yeah. Where we ended up being successful, and it was again so much vetting that went into us as people and yeah. the way that we worked and collaborated. Yeah, we can talk about that uh, if this is helpful because. It can be difficult to understand through a written document what it's like to work with people. You know, like that's that's just a natural in constraint of the of the format. Um, some of the ways that we've had people successfully get there, uh, we had a recent one where they actually asked us to create like a video uh, of like us talking through some of their challenges, um, and they asked they asked all their shortlisted candidates to do that even before they got to the uh, final stage. That was really smart. I thought that was really good. Uh, it factored into the scoring, so it was scored, uh, but it provided a more human element uh, that I think was really helpful. And then a second one that was recent as well, another finals presentation where they actually invited us to do, a, do an actual workshop. So we sat down uh, with their team um, and we actually uh, chose like a piece of their problem and walked, th and walked through a real workshop with them for, for an hour. Obviously that takes time and you don't wanna be doing that with all 20 of the initial <laughs> or 80 or whatever. Um, but it certainly helps uh, clarify um, who you can work with. Cool. Uh, hey, Jay. Yeah. It's a great question. Have you seen like templates? I know there's, I like personally, my feeling, I know it's not, like there's, there's RFP software companies like Proposify, um, HubSpot has some really good templates as well. I personally feel um, they're because I think HubSpot is very like marketing oriented. Their um, their templates tend to be much more like concise, much more like outcomes oriented. Yeah, yeah. I, would, I would say like similar to I guess what, what Bjorn was chatting about. Um, you know, lead with the problem. Yeah. Lead with what it is that you want to see explore rather than yeah. You're a hundred and two mm -hmm. and you, you've read all of those terms and conditions but you still have no idea what the actual product is. Um, so yeah. I, I would say, yeah, I any any template that, that leads with um, actually the problem that you're looking to solve would be mm -hmm. I find a lot of like the proposal software companies have really good templates. Like a lot of those groups, they, they often, because that's the kind of what they do. Um, and a lot of those templates, if you're looking for just something to start with, I think that's often a really good one. And they're often, they're often free or you have to, you know, give up your email to, to get it. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. For sure. Yeah, yeah, it's it's a really good question because, um, you know, I mean, obviously a lot of organizations are stuck with the template they have, but if you're not, um, yeah, finding something that's more of a business case is actually very, very helpful. Cool. I'm just jumping over to another question. Oh, sorry. Twice. Sorry about that. Sorry about that. <laughs> We've written, yeah, we've written proposals, but yeah, we've read a lot of RFPs.
That's a good question. I have one thought of that, but yeah, I, I do too. And I, I go was ahead. thinking of the, the video. The That's what I was thinking about yeah, as well, actually. That, that was that was the Same first one. time we we encountered something like that, and yeah. all it was a great kind of like a vehicle to to really help the app, the proponent collect mm -hmm. the app, collect a, a vendor. It was it was a huge pain in the butt. To be totally <laughs> honest with yeah. You. Um, it was really really involved, um, and it and it definitely challenged our team um, because in finalist presentations we're often very collaborative um, and we can kind of bounce ideas off of each other, but in this it was really it was very siloed. We were just going mm. through each piece of the video and then putting it out. So I would suggest that that yeah that was one that really challenged our team. I would say. Yeah, I agree. It was challenging. I do like I do like the idea of um, some original response to a problem. Uh, I think that's really really helpful because well because a lot of RFPs are really just like you know a very numbing set of like, um, you know, numbered and subnumbered questions. Can you explain who's your hosting partner? And you write your little thing in, in the spreadsheet. Um, if you get, if you're able to break out of that and ask, ask a vendor, you know, talk to us about, um, you know, how would you improve our information architecture? Um, you know, how would you make our site more accessible? Uh, maybe it could be a video and we've seen that work well, um, or it could be like a short, um, kind of narrative of, of how you'd approach that. Anything you can do to mimic the actual experience of working with that group. Because in the same way that um, a finals presentation isn't necessarily that similar of a format to how you actually work with a vendor, neither is a proposal. I mean, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a very artificial format um, where you know, you're probably going to be um, looking more for somebody who has insights and creativity and ideas. Uh, and if you can get them to um, have a format to do that, um, then you can often see, it's often quite revealing. That's right. So what, how do you stay focused on the detail while Yeah, and that's where like we probably have passed up really good projects because we just didn't know if that could be a good project or not. Yeah. Um, where you know they didn't disclose a budget, and the onerousness of responding we could tell was so high that we decided you know, maybe wrongly to opt out. Um, so for sure, like uh, our scoring is fairly heavily weighted toward you know um, if. If they, I'll put it this way, if they provide any indication of budget at all, that shoots it up the pile yeah. quite a bit. Um, and you know, obviously it's not just all about budget, but that's a huge indicator of uh, how much of a fit that group is for you. Yeah, if they thought out the project and they exactly. have an idea about yeah. the moving pieces that may be involved in yeah, doing the group last minute. Totally, and there's, there's um, great agencies that do $50,000 projects, there's great agencies that do $250,000 projects, so, you know, there's um, disclosing a budget just helps you make make that obviously makes that match right away, and helps us score significantly more efficiently. Cool. Hi. <laughs>
So if, if for example, there's an incumbent vendor, is that, that thinking? Yeah, yeah. And they, they have written their requirements and then we're responding to. Yeah, I think, I guess obviously um, there's sometimes natural competition between uh, an, an incumbent and and uh, somebody who's, who's vying for to be part of that um, that project, but it it can be very helpful. It's certainly um, like anyone with an inside track who understands the situation, who can you know provide us a lay of the land, is super helpful, extremely helpful. Um, so if if a vendor understands um, you know the nature of the problem and connect under, and knows where the bodies are buried and can talk that through. Very, very helpful. Um, in terms of like collaborating with them, yeah, I, I mean, I think I can see that being useful in working as long as, you know, there's n if there, as long as there's no vested interest and as long as there's a, the ability to kind of be, um, you know, collegial about it. And a lot of times there is, like a lot of times what we find, this happens to us quite a bit, is we're working with an incumbent because that incumbent no longer wants to be in that sector. It happens all the time. Um, so the actual incumbent will be looking to make an exit and we'll help them um, kind of get, get, get through that um, so that they can feel confident that the team they're handing it off to understands them and isn't, isn't leaving it um, in a bad state. Yeah. Oh, sorry. <laughs> One last yes, please. Yeah, so I think, sorry, I'm, I'm kind of talking, oh, talking, no, talking. Sorry, yeah, it's fine. <laughs> yeah, so I mean, it's great for, again, building that rapport and, and it's, it's a litmus test to kind of see, again, can you work with these folks? So that's very key. And the other piece is just clarifying. Um, there's so many RFPs where, uh, I mean, we'll go through the document and there's like, could be one of like three things and we'll all, all kind of sit there and talk about it. Is it their job? Hey, and just kind of make a guess and go for it. And if we had the clarification, we could go all in on actually delivering exactly what the, the um, just direct client uh, is looking for. Mm -hmm. I agree with that. The other thing is like a QA and a is two way, right? So it's often revealing the questions vendors ask you. Um, so, you know, this is probably their first chance to really figure out the questions they have about the natural ambiguities in the RP process. So this is a chance where they can maybe ask you, um, is there flexibility on on your timeline? Would you be open to these alternate approaches that we're that we're thinking about? Um, the worst, to me, sign in a final presentation is when you ask a vendor, "Do you have any questions?" and they say no. <laughs> you know, you want them to be able to have thought about your situation and have prepared um, some um, probing questions to help them better understand that um, your situation. Hundred percent. Yeah. Perfect. That's a great, I, I think that's such an excellent way of doing it. And, you know, as much as you can, through whatever means you have to, technically cheating, not actually cheating, don't actually do that. But, um, you know, figuring out some way that you can um, start some kind of conversation about, about this, yeah.
Because a lot of times you are, like as you know, if you're hemmed in, you're not able to do things that you want to do as a proponent. Uh, but the more that you can find ways to do that through the pre-conference, a variety of ways to start that conversation going, definitely like a, a draft um, pre-submission is great. That's a great suggestion. Yeah, really nice. Absolutely. That's the that's the goal. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, I mean, I feel like we've kind of beaten up on our, like he, we have beaten up on RFPs a lot. Maybe it's because we live in the RFP world and we're like, oh, they, ah, those things. They, they have some be benefits too. Like they, you know, they can, the goal of them is to be, you know, objective and, and to um, get the same requirements to a large number of people and get them to respond and see how they respond. But yeah, in a perfect world, I think it is beneficial um, to have at the minimum to start with something less formal, like, like, like an email for sure, like here's, what, here's my budget, here's what I'm trying to do. Like when you're, like we're kind of assuming, when we're talking to vendors through this process, these are reputable vendors. These are vendors who have a track record, they're not trying to you know, cheat you, they're not just gonna see your budget and, and say ooh, you know. <laughs> they, they, they um, all that they need is the right information to craft a solution. Um, so if you are able to reach out to you know three to five different groups and and say um, you know this is my approximate budget this is my approximate timeline um, these are some of the things I'm trying to achieve can I sit down and talk with you about how you might approach that or what kind of questions you might have um, absolutely I think I think it's a good a good approach um, and I think disclosing that information up front um, you know the agencies will thank you for it because um, that's the information they need to kind of create the right solution. Yeah, exactly. What do you want? Yeah. The other thing is like, you don't always have to disclose budget. Like maybe, you know, having a conversation in any way is really helpful because um, maybe you're not ready to disclose your budget yet, but as you, if you are able to um, start some kind of dialogue happening with the, with the proponent, or sorry, with the, with, the, with the vendor, they're like, oh, that's what you're trying to do. Now I understand. Here, I actually do have a budget that works for you. Here's my, um, here's what I would suggest the budget range would be for what you're trying to achieve. The only reason budget is an obstacle in the RP process is because there isn't enough information to go on. Um, the more information you give the vendor, the more likely that they'll be able to come up with a budget with confidence. Okay, cool. Thanks everybody for coming out. I hope you have a... Have a great rest of your DrupalCon.